five of us that were all working together at the School of Global Studies um, at Thomasite University here in Bangkok. Um, all of us were involved with things like facilitation and systems thinking and um, design thinking and, and a lot of interesting related uh, things. And what we wanted to do was try to bring all those things together um, to do something for communities to try to help work on some of these big wicked problems that, um, that everyone's dealing with. And um, what we kind of did without knowing it was kind of reinvented the idea of um, systemic design um, by, by kind of, you know, just kind of talking through how we could use um, these, these skill sets and knowledge and all that. Um, and what we did, we were very intentional when we started was to take a step back when, when we thought, let's do something with this skill set. We, we all kind of sat around when we got together for coffee several times and talked about, you know, what, what did we want to do? Um, what did we want to try to achieve? How could we bring these things together? You know, what could we do with the design principles and systems thinking um, and make it accessible to, to bring people together from the community and get them thinking about these sorts of problems and, and working together and, and making this something that wasn't just for um, experts, but just for everyone, anyone who wanted to take part, make it possible for them to do that. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how, how we got started. And what we did was we, we kind of, um, uh, Courtney, can you go to the next slide? Um, so what, what we did was we started doing some, some workshops and we spent a lot of time um, with people kind of teaching them the, the basic principles, uh, spent a lot more time on problem, understanding problems and very little time on the ideation so that people could really start to get an understanding of what was causing the outcomes that were undesired. Uh, so we, were, we would spend loads and loads of time going out, interviewing people, observing uh, things in the community and just trying to understand what were the forces that were causing problems. Um, probably I think in our first series of workshops, we had spent four Saturdays together. And I think it wasn't until late in the third Saturday that we actually started digging into possibilities. Uh, but over, we spread out those first three weeks over I think six weeks. Um, and and in, in the interim, it was lots of research and digging into the problem and trying to see what was causing them. Um, so for us, it was a very different approach to, to what we had seen in the past. And then we, of course, stumbled upon what people were doing all over the world, which was very similar. So that was really exciting. Uh, next slide, Courtney. So we had three goals that when we started with this. One was just creating community, bringing people together who had similar, similar desires of wanting to work on these kinds of issues at the community level um, and, and just trying to get, you know, kind of build that connective tissue between people who wanted to work together on these things. Next slide. Two was building capacity. It wasn't like, um, let's go immediately solve all of these problems, but let's start to build the capacity so that either together working on projects or each of us off on our jobs, working on the things that we were doing in, you know, in our daytime thing, um, so that we would all be better capable to handle these sorts of issues and come up with better solutions and, and deliver better and those sorts of things. And then goal number three, um, just driving beneficial change. So that's what we, we've slowly been shifting our focus from capacity building and community building to moving towards doing things that are actually having more impact. And so we'll talk a bit more about that as we go into some of the projects we've been working on. And so, um, one of our main principles we wanted to make sure we got this out here was you know that to lift borrow steal and remix so we give credit whenever we use anything from other groups but we we don't try to constantly reinvent the wheel we, we create tools when we need them if somebody else has built something great that really does what we need we grab that we use it we share it we make sure we give you know, ample credit um, but there are loads of really good tools out there from a lot of different groups so just want to recommend that, you know, use the stuff that's there and spend your time making a difference if, if the tools are already out there. Okay. Next slide. Now I'll hand off to Courtney here. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so Chris was just sharing a little bit of the, the backstory, right? We really started very organically. It was just a curious question that we had, um, the four of us, or the five of us that were faculty, 
um, teaching design and innovation. We said, what if we could do this with the, the broader community on really complex challenges? You know, and typically the ones that we're pointing at government or private sector and saying, hey, why aren't these solved? Um, and so we are just using systemic design as this process to literally facilitate the, uh, you know, a group through. And what we found, as Chris was mentioning, um, very organically, um, dozens and dozens of people. Our first uh, big event that we had, we had over 100 people coming. And the big challenge that we first and it started with was waste management. Um, what was neat is, as Chris was sharing just a little bit of that story, um, we ended up uh, with several groups trying different prototypes by the end of the process of the, of the workshop series. And then we had about 20 people over the course of three months last summer saying, let's do a 2.0. And when we do 2.0, let's use a process again, but let's expand to some other themes that are important to us. And so when I say us, I mean people that just literally said, I wanna get involved further. I'm really interested in this other issue. And so we continued with waste management, but we also expanded to air pollution and unsustainable fast fashion. And so the process itself is agnostic in the sense that of course you can apply it to so many complex challenges. And so we did a 2.0 and um, similar, the intent was to see how might we be able to build a prototype which could look like service intervention, product in intervention, or maybe even policy intervention um, that is literally impacting the trajectory of a system for a systems change effect. And so what I'm gonna share in just the next few minutes, and I'll try to be very brief because I know it's more important actually to get to the, to the workshopping part. Um, but I wanted to, sh to share literally how through this organic process, um, what has evolved and where we are currently with one of the prototypes, which is around air pollution, as I was mentioning. And so, um, as you may know, air pollution, and I think if you're based in Asia, then you really know this because you're experiencing it on a daily or seasonal basis, but it's a, com a very complex and entrenched issue. The majority of the most polluted cities in the world are actually based here in Asia. And the harmful effects are, are, there's a long laundry list of them. And so what we wanted to do um, through this experimental open innovation platform, which is you know, run literally 100% by volunteers, we're not registered. Um, the model that works is really our social capital model. It's, it's cross-pollinating, creating the space for everybody to exchange um, you know, what they want, but also just literally all these latent resources that are in the community. Um, that are connections, that are you know, nodes of influence or possible power to shift certain types of uh, dynamics. So what I wanted to mention is that um, we have an intent and I think that's the most important thing. So some of you, I, I know I've heard from the round table, right? You're starting your own collectives or you're working in government or you're studying something or you wanna see a change in the community. Um, what's most critical, I suppose, is really that, uh, that intent, that mission, that thing that gets everyone to the table for the same common goal. And for us, um, in this case, specifically in this case I'm sharing, um, you know, is, is about how can we impact uh, the air pollution. So I'm going to share a little bit of that story. Here's some of the images from the gatherings. Um, we do benefit from a third space uh, that is called Bangkok 1899. And it's a community space. And this is where we hold a lot of our events, not all of them. Um, and some are just as simple as a, as a you know, a, a happy hour. Um, and then others are a bit more structured and it, to the point that we have literally like, you know, a three or four hour afternoon workshop. Now, just to, to contextualize it a little bit, um, you may have seen this already, but this is from the uh, out of Nesta's DIY toolkit. It's been around for some time, but I found that this frame is really helpful when we when we bring people together and we say we want to change something. Well, how do we go from understanding the opportunity and the challenge to systems change because that feels so overwhelming sometimes. And so really circular design lab in a lot of where we are is kind of in this space between, you know, one and four. We definitely start with opportunities and challenges. And then ideally, you know, with our ambition is, is to do something really large scale and, and make a difference. So another um, diagram here that I think is, is helpful. Maybe you've seen this, this is initially from a Burkana model, but we know that we're in a, in a global moment of transition and change, and we have some dominant systems. In the context of air uh, quality, we're looking at a fossil fuel industry that is really a, a sunset industry in many ways. Um, so how do you usher in a space of new possibilities and change? And just to have a, a frame of seeing this kind of flow, to me is actually quite helpful for understanding and locating you know, where we're operating as well from that kind of you know, socio-technical, political um, perspective. 
Another way of uh, looking at it too is understanding that change happens, of course, on so many different scales. And so I know many of you are practitioners, so this is probably resonating. Um, and I find that when I'm, when I'm you know, in a workshop or sharing this with others, it's also again helpful just to simply locate where we are in the conversational space. So um, you know, as a process uh, piece, we really find it helpful and beneficial to offer a variety of different frameworks and visuals to, to in our workshops, because not everyone, as Chris was mentioning, we're building capability, we're building capacity. Um, not everyone's coming to the table with the same set of skills and experience. So just having that way of calibrating for that is also really important. Now, as for us in the air pollution space, um, the past few years have been significantly uh, increasingly more um, problematic in regards to the air quality, particularly in Thailand and Bangkok. Now, the source points of that is really where, when we came through these workshops, we said, what are the issues? Where is it the farmers burning the fields? Is it Im industrial emissions? Is it uh, you know, too many cars on the road, for example? And so what we went through, after going through a series of these kinds of um, moments of meeting up and, and working through it through a process, um, we started mapping the system. So this is our rich picture um, in the Alberta Colab systemic design. Uh, they have that nice facilitation process for this, but we literally used um, specifically that one for, for this moment. But we just wanted to map out and draw, okay, from all of our perspectives in this context of, of Thailand, um, where are we noticing the issues? What are the drivers? Um, what are some of the outcomes of, to that extent? The next, the next piece to this was actually identifying um, the leverage points, right? Um, now, this maybe oversimplifies, but just for the sake of time, I'm trying to move a bit quickly through it. Um, but what we did is, again, we mapped out what was the, the, the way that we understand it and understand and see from a cultural contextual perspective, um, the issues, and then what are the core drivers? Now, what was interesting to me in this process, and you see these red sticky dots, this is where we collectively voted on um, what did we think <laughs> this is almost an intuitive vote, really. But what do we think? If we were to change one little, if we press, put pressure on one part of the system, where might we get more of an effect? Um, so that 80-20 you know, point of view, understanding that we are a small group with very limited resources, and there's also very different contextual factors at play. And so uh, long story short, what we landed on here was two things. One, uh, education and awareness if we were to be able to increase and maximize more of that for the for the, um, the communities where we are that would be impactful and the other one was policy change that may seem like a no-brainer but typically when you're working at a community level um, depending on the situation it feels like that's very out of reach now what we discovered um, and we settled on those two things what we discovered is in that thailand in this context there is a mechanism a policy mechanism that allows for citizen driven legislation to be tabled at parliament. So um, what happens is that one of the ladies that came to our workshop, she's the co-founder of the Thailand Clean Air Network and her and, a, and another consortium of other small group of volunteers have been working for two years on researching and figuring out through a policy process, how to literally get one of the first clean air acts of Thailand ever established. Um, and because of this, uh, we have a campaign. <laughs> so uh, what we wanted to do is a digital, an actual roadshow. And uh, it became a digital roadshow because of COVID. And the idea was that how do we get 10,000 citizen signatures of informed citizens to be signing the official paperwork process to get this legislation uh, put forward to parliament here in Thailand. And so we launched, um, being very brief really, but um, we created a website um, and we wanted to make sure that people understood, it's in Thai and English. I'm showing you the screenshots of the, the English version, understanding it's mostly international audience, but we have the exact same version in, in fully Thai as well. Um, but we wanted everyone to start understanding this is something that you can take action on. And so one of the key pieces here though, is that this, uh, the research that was created by the Thailand Clean Air Network is very complex. Um, it's actually ended up, if you translate it, it's a, uh, from, from Thai to English, it ends up being around 200 pages. Now, most people, everyday people, and, and this was surfaced through our, when we did rapid ethnography as well, um, if you're a street vendor selling food, if you are um, living in a house that doesn't have aircon or sealed, uh, let's say, um, you know, 
doors and windows perfectly, you're going to have be affected by PM 2.5, but you may not, and air pollution that, for that matter, but you may not necessarily find it to be the first priority to be worried about. Um, and then secondly, if you are, what do you do about it? So on multiple scales and multiple levels, we wanted to create an uh, informational way of reaching different people. So the following an EU process, white paper, blue paper, green paper, um, the white paper is 20 pages. We have that here in English and Thai on the website. This is what's going on in the context of Thailand. And then the blue paper, it's literally the backbone of, a, uh, of legislation put forward. So this was something that we understood not everybody would actually be consuming. So we wanted to create the roadshow, which is now digital, as I mentioned, but with some offline events where we can have it um, to be consumable by everybody. So we have two tracks, which is inhale, exhale. And these are two sessions per month. One is literally about the creative ways in which you could be thinking of responding to air pollution issue. And that comes from circular economy perspective. We had entrepreneurs from India. You may have heard of Gravinky Labs. They've created printing ink out of air emissions. Um, we have the first e-motorbike uh, entrepreneur for Thailand who's trying to scale and create a battery subscription model as well um, for Thailand. He was speaking. We have artists. We have high school students that have been winning um, competition on, on how to respond to the air pollution issue. So it's a hybrid effect. Um, and we're trying to do is reach as many people as possible and document everything as we go. So if you actually do end up going to the site, you'll notice we've got a YouTube channel, Medium, the posts, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, understanding that this, it takes a lot of different touch points through to reach a lot of different people. Um, but the long game is really policy change and the ability to start collecting the signatures was just granted by the government in August. And the first 400 signatures were actually collected um, at an event just last month where we were able to meet face to face, luckily in Thailand, there's not so much uh, COVID knock on wood. Um, but as you can see, it's actually um, a cross generational uh, group of, uh, of people that this impacts. And so we're trying to create as many spaces and opportunities for, for people to uh, connect with it, but then also feel not disempowered, but actually really empowered about what you can do. So the photo in the top left is of a, of a kid that won the arts competition around, um, around the issue. Um, we had a clean air future participatory design um, workshop. We did the best we could. It, it, we had to be kind of thrown into the hallway, which actually probably helped us get more foot traffic. And we had a booth set up as well for, for people that are Thai nationals to be able to, to sign the, the, the paperwork required. So it's a long road um, and we have a cross section a mix of people, but we also have a little bit of funding. And I, and I did want to mention this too, um, from the Royal Society of the Arts, which actually provided, Chris didn't mention it, but they provided the seed funding for our initial set of, uh, of workshops. So that is important to think about, you know, if, if it wasn't for that little bit of funding from that organization, Chris and I are RSA fellows, um, you know, paying out of pocket for lots of workshops on weekends is, is not sustainable. Um, and, and also being able to offer food, you know, it does add up over time. The space often was donated in kind. Um, but we've been able to partner with them. I think I'll, I'll skip through some of these technical issues around, um, around the, the, the clean air issue, but this does show you that there is a, a pathway towards getting legislation. Um, well, I should say this too, uh, you know, really it's also now reframing, providing a frame in which people are under, seeing this dramatic issue and through new eyes and through a new lens. So we would like to continue to be able to be a voice for, for thinking creatively about what that looks like. But to finish the point I was making about the funding, um, it's really uh, an incredibly minor investment by a, an organization to see, to be able to accelerate this much uh, kind of, ownership and, and conversation and, and trajectory. So not everything that comes through the lab, of course, has to be about changing national policy. Um, and I hope that we get there, but we will have other spaces in which um, other things that we're doing too, which we got a little bit of funding from MIT, um, International Development Innovation Network to build, to run DIY air filter workshops. So next month, um, we're gonna be partnering with the Urban Studies Lab and literally going out into the communities of some of the most vulnerable areas of Bangkok to be able to um, help create for literally, uh, you know, $15 in an oscillating fan, which everybody typically has, 
um, you know, air filters for when the, the seasonal pollution gets worse. So people are more educated, we're able to make a tutorial, put it on our YouTube in both languages. Um, and then hopefully again, that's a band-aid to the symptom, but it does allow for more awareness to come through as well at the same time. Um, and then finally, uh, RSA has been amazing. They have a student design awards. This was just launched. Um, the, the creative brief around the right to clean air, Circular Design Lab is positioned as the knowledge partner. Um, so we're hoping to crowdsource really interesting uh, design responses from students globally around the issue. It doesn't have to only be for Thailand, of course, uh, but it's quite neat to be able to start seeing uh, other organizations um, looking at this as well with us through this lens of creativity. So I think I'll stop there. Happy to answer questions, maybe anytime really, possibly after the workshop is better. but. Um, that's just to share a little bit of a case study of, of what's kind of neatly emerged organically through this process that was really enabled through uh, systemic design tools, if you will, and a lot of uh, volunteer hours amongst many, many people. So Chris, over to you. And I, I just want to take a moment to um, con congratulate you and Laura and the team for what you've done with that. I've stood off to the side while they did this clean air thing and I thought, oh, they're going to run a few um, events to to kind of get the word out and then you know we'd move on to something else but I mean they've it's it's been an amazing case study of, of advocacy of you know how to take limited resources and really start to move mountains so con congratulations guys I, I've just really been impressive um, so very very cool stuff but yeah just to mention sorry just to say Liepa and Laura on the call I mean, sorry, that are facilitators, they're co-leads as well. Oh, um, I left the off, and, sorry. Yep, <laughs> and um, and Prewa, who is also the other facilitator and co-initiator of the lab, um, it was her, because she invited the the lead of the Thailand Cleaner Network to our workshops, that's the only reason it's gotten to this, this stage. So it's very interesting to trace back what seems like just a very uh, simple, you know, introduction or bringing in one or two people can lead to incredible collaborations. Um, so I just want to say the power of social capital uh, networks is absolutely not to be underestimated. And um, anyway, that's a whole other maybe session actually. Okay, so Chris, back to what we're doing. <laughs> okay, so before we jump into the workshop, we, we're doing multiple different things with Circular Design Lab. And Leopold, would you like to take a minute to just really quickly share what we did with Circular Innovation Jam? Yeah, sure. Uh, so a couple of months ago, we ran a digital one week workshop on systemic design and it was centered around uh, plastic waste. The goal was to go through the whole uh, system thinking process and then get uh, people to team up together and uh, create a prototype for solving that issue. And again, it just shows how community is able to come together with really diverse uh, skill sets and from the diverse backgrounds. And there is so much motivation and interest in there that you know it's, it's hard to keep the engagement in a digital space. But after one week, we had a bunch of ideas that were really at a really good um, stage. And then we had uh, for the next round, a coaching session from our regional partners who helped to bring those ideas further. So it again shows that there are opportunities out there and just catching those and kind of putting your foot in the door. And then as you get the momentum, it just keeps growing. So really encourage for those who are maybe afraid of doing digital events or unsure whether it will work or not, it's just kind of getting your uh, hands dirty and just, just doing it. Uh, that's the whole point. And Chris and myself, we learned a lot. It was not an easy journey to, to handle events like this digital because a lot of it is about feeling the energy of the room. At the same time, it was great. Uh, so really encouraged to look for and spot those opportunities and just take them and act. Yeah, I'm talking I about action, back to Chris. <clears throat> <laughs> I, I remember when we were running that, I was like, it, it, it was more challenging to connect with the, the audience than when you're in a physical space. And I was afraid that people weren't getting as much out of it. And then I was really um, super pleased with what, what the groups came up with in just a, a one week long program. So yeah, I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, uh, Courtney, can you take me to the next slide? We'll give a quick overview of what we're going to do here for the, the rest of the session. 
Um, so we've got two different exercises that are related. The first one, we're gonna share experiences and then reflect on, on how we use systemic design, and that's everyone in the room, um, what we use it for, how we're spreading its use, and what we think might help increase its spread. So we'll, first, we'll share those on uh, a template in Mural, and then we'll reflect a bit on what, um, what we've heard from each other, and then we'll go into, we'll come back after that and give the instructions for exercise two which is kind of a, a rapid ideation and sorting exercise where we'll propose lots of ideas for ways we, we could experiment with bringing systemic design to communities more broadly. So making these uh, kind of complex and, and complicated tools easier for people to, to use. Um, so that can either we could, you know, work with people who, you know, more, more working directly with communities with less expertise or making these tools available for them to go in and do their own programs. So uh, next slide, please. So here's, here's the, um, the uh, instructions for this first exercise. So we're gonna, we'll send everyone into breakout rooms and then we'll have a link from Mural for the individual breakout room. So you have about, I think we're gonna go with three breakouts at this point, given the number of people we have. Um, so facilitators will be there to assist in the exercise. We'll, we'll have one person, Liepa, Laura, and um, Prewa will all be in one of the rooms. And then Courtney and I will bounce around um, between rooms uh, as we go. So we'll be there to answer questions. We'll also take part in the exercise with everyone. Um, in Mural, something's happened to my screen. There we go. Um, up in the top right hand corner in Mural, the, what's highlighted in pink is, I'm losing the screen, the outlines button. Mine? Yeah, I had the screen and it just switched to Liepa. That was strange. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, in the upper right hand corner of the um, of Mural, there's a button called Outlines. You click on that and then a set of instructions will be on the right hand side of the screen for those aren't familiar. Click on number one, it will highlight that portion of the screen that's relevant to those instructions. And it's a more detailed set of instruction than, than what's in the template. So as you as you go through, um, you click on that number one. Can you click on number one overview for me? Mm -hmm. And that should yeah. go to the whole page. You click on number two, exercise one, it's gonna highlight that portion of the page. And then you have a bit of additional instruction over what's there. In this first section, what we're going to do is answer the four questions, one, two, three, and four. As individuals, just take a post-it note, put down some thoughts in there, and go around those, those four. And then once you're done, just wait and you can share with uh, the, the group in your breakout room what, you, what you've written down. And then we'll take five minutes or so after everyone's had a chance to share and just reflect upon what we've heard in number five, which is at the center. Once we're done with that, We'll come back to the main room here with everyone and we'll, we'll give out the instructions for exercise two. And any questions about that before we get started? Uh, is it possible to do this from the phone? Uh, it, I'm not sure how well the, um, it works, but we can work with you through chat if we need to. Uh, yeah, to help that's share, cool. share, put your ideas up there. Yeah. Uh, okay. And if your connection is tough, um, that's the the role of uh, the facilitators. We can take the notes for you, for everybody as okay. well. Okay. No that's problem. great. Thank you. Thank and you. each of the facilitators will send um, the link to your mural in the chat box mm -hmm. once you're divided into the group. Mm -hmm. We all have different uh, links. Any, any other questions? And Chris, just to regroup, uh, how much time should we allocate for the activity given uh, we are at 7.50 now? Um, you know, I, I think it's gonna take us at least 20 minutes. Let's, um, let's, let's aim for 20 minutes and see, see how it goes. I'll, we'll be checking around in the different breakout rooms. If we can get done sooner, we'll, we'll move on, but I think it'll probably take that long. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, Courtney, let's... Um, what do you say go to, to uh, three sets of breakout rooms? Yep, I just made you host, so you have that uh, function now. Okay. I can never find the controls in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All 
I don't see the breakout rooms. Control. Oh, really? oh there it is. Got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm sending everyone to breakout rooms and we'll, um, we'll be around to visit with you guys. Please go ahead and join those.